Good morning and welcome to the African Television Channel broadcasting from Clark Atlanta University again. And uh, my name is Ambassador Tunde Aretunji. Of course, tribute to uh, the human dignity of the war. Former President Nelson Mandela, how he has lived his life by faith. Faith is a lifestyle, not a formula. And what he has done has shaken the world. Thank you, President Nelson Mandela for showing us the leadership, for showing us the way. Of course, as we go along, we need to now see the YALI, the Young African Leaders Initiative, that will now bring leaders, that will create leaders, not rulers, as said by former President Barack Obama. A leader that is going there but there for 35 years, 40 years, what do we get from that? We, young, we need young, vibrant leaders that will now take the rim of, uh, of uh, circumstances of Africa to reality. That will change things. Change is the only constant thing in life. Uh, growth is a recession. Now we have young, vibrant leaders with brilliant ideas preparing Africa into the next century, the next generation. Thank you, President Nelson Mandela, for laying a good example. Well, of course, I just talk about the Africa Open for Business, then the Africa Matters. And this has been the slogan launched by the Africa Heritage Foundation, where the initiative that started since 1996 is going across the world and is now a reality. Atlanta has been the big place. Of course, good news and great news. Africa Atlanta Project by the Africa Heritage Foundation has been nominated as shortlisted for the Priceless Award, the World Energy Award, which actually hosts about 177 countries. This is the only project in America that was shortlisted for that. It's a great news. Thank you so much for you, those people who have supported this initiative since 1996. We are going far. Thank you so much. Now, of course, our program is going to churches, going to community leaders, going to community centers, going to um, universities. And now, on the 8th of December, history is going to be made at the Word of Faith, where we have about 25,000 members making the membership of Word of Faith. They are ready to support the Africa Open for Business. Taking your business global, that is the scenario that is set up in on the on the eighth of uh, December. Be part of it. Thank you. Now, Young African Leaders Initiative. Here we go. Thank you. It may be that somebody in Burma can, on the internet, see how you organized your campaign and how you were able to finance it and what you were able to accomplish and suddenly what you've done in one country becomes uh, a model uh, for uh, action all across, the, uh, all across the world. So this is going to be a top priority of mine. I, 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 will, uh, I will definitely continue to be involved in that. All right? Uh, let's see. I've got, 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 a, got a call on a man now. Let's see. Let's see. I, 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 I'm, I'm going to call on this guy right there. Yeah, really, you right there. No, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, you right there. Just, just because it's just because I like that hat. That's a sharp looking hat right there. My name is uh, Sabir. I come from uh, Madagascar. There you go. Uh, we, the Malagasy Fellows, are involved in the uh, environmental uh, entrepreneurship. Uh -huh. So, what is, the what is the commitment of the United States towards uh, young entrepreneurship and climate change? Well, as I said before, we are pledging, we've got a, a billion dollars for entrepreneurship. Half of it we are going to direct towards women entrepreneurs and young people who are entrepreneurs because they've been underrepresented in terms of access to capital. And as I mentioned to the young man earlier, the opportunities for entrepreneurship related to clean energy, related to conservation, 
which oftentimes in a place like Madagascar involves tourism and ecotourism, there's, there's huge potential there if it's done properly. So the key uh, is in some cases just the access to financing, but part of what you've learned hopefully with Yali is part of it is also having a well thought out plan. Now not everybody can afford uh, to go to a fancy business school and you know, you know, graduate uh, and, and have all the credentials, but that doesn't mean you don't have a, a good idea. And one of the things that we're trying to do, particularly through online learning, is to create some of the basic concepts for how a business or a nonprofit can get started, how it can be properly managed, how you can account, uh, do the accounting in a way that's efficient. We want to make sure that we are a continuing partner for you as you start your business and you learn. And this is where these regional networks that we're setting up is also useful because not only will we have online learning, but these regional hubs initially in four uh, regions of Africa allow you to continue to network and access through uh, the U.S. Embassy or the Chambers of Commerce or private sector participants who are partnering with us uh, so that you can have hands-on mentoring and learning uh, as you are developing your business plans uh, and as you're trying to move forward. Uh, the one thing for, for those of you who are entrepreneurs uh, or you know, aspiring entrepreneurs to remember is all around the world, even in the United States, you know, not every idea, idea succeeds. So if you, want to, if you want to be an entrepreneur and start a business, you have to believe with all your heart that you're going to succeed. But then when, the, and if one of the businesses fails, you've got to be able to get up, dust yourself off, start, figure out what you learned, and then start another business. And, and eventually, you know, it, it's, it's from continually uh, refining your ideas and exploring what works and understanding what your market is and, and what consumers are looking for that eventually you have a chance to succeed. All right? Okay. Uh, it's a young woman's turn now. Well, she's just dancing over here. So, so we'll have to call on her. That doesn't mean, by the way, everybody should dance. I just wanted to point that out. Go ahead. Mr. President, thank you. My name is Marilyn Gemo from Cameroon, and I would like to find out if you will support Africa's candidature for a permanent seat at the UN Security Council. Mm. Thank you. The, uh, so the Security Council was, was formed uh, after World War II, uh, and Obviously, the world and the balance of power around the world looked very different in 1945, 1946, 47 than it does in 2015, 16, and 17. So the United States is supportive in concept of modifications to the structure of the United Nations Security Council. I will be honest with you, how that happens and how you balance all the equities is complicated. As a matter of principle, I would think that there should at least be one representative from the African continent on the Security Council, along with representatives from the other regions of the world and some of the other powers that have emerged. Uh, I will tell you that, because for example, Latin America does not have a uh, a country that's represented. Uh, it does get complicated because you have to figure out how, let me put it this way, everybody probably thinks they should be on. And so even in Africa, if you started saying, okay, let's say uh, we should have an Africa. Is it South Africa? Is it Nigeria? Is uh, see, <laughs> so Uganda. See, uh, suddenly everybody, everybody was thinking, "Well, why not me?" 
Um, the same is true in you know, Japan. It, it considers itself as one of the largest economies in the world. Uh, suitable, Brazil thinks it should be on. India, the world's largest democracy. Uh, you know, uh, so uh, we're going to have to design a process uh, whereby all these various uh, legitimate arguments are sorted through. Uh, but what, what I very much believe is that for the United Nations Security Council to be effective, it has to be more representative of, of uh, all the various uh, trend lines that have occurred over the last uh, several decades. One thing I will say, though, about the United Nations, uh, everybody wants a seat at the table, but sometimes people don't want the responsibilities of having a seat at the table. And that's, that, that's happening even now. And the one thing I've learned, both in my personal life and in my political life, is that if you want more authority, then you also have to be more responsible. You, you can't uh, wear the crown if you can't bear the cross. And oftentimes uh, in the United Nations, which I am very committed to, and the agencies there do a lot of really critical, important work, but when it comes to, okay, who's going to actually step up and contribute to peacekeeping? Who's going to actually write a check when it comes to making sure that we're dealing with the Ebola crisis? Who's going to show leadership in tackling climate change? Are you willing to speak out on issues even when it contradicts your own interests? Or when it's politically hard? Or when it's uncomfortable? Well, you know, if, if you're not willing to do those things, you know, this is not just something where, okay, I got a membership key in, to the club and now I'm just going to, you know, show off how important I am. And, and that, uh, you know, you see that sometimes. Um, this happens, and, and, and sometimes it happens in our own agencies. You know, the, the, on human rights, when I was in Kenya, I said, that it's not enough for the United States always to be the heavy who has to point out that it's unsuitable for uh, leaders to ignore their constitution and try to cling on to power. Their neighbors have to speak up as well, even if it's uncomfortable, right? But it, so, so my attitude is if you want to... If you want to participate, then you have to recognize that you have broader responsibilities. And that's something that you, the United States, by the way, uh, you know, for all our occasional mistakes or flaws or you know, our policy is not perfect uh, all the time, the one thing we do try to be is responsible. If there's an you know, uh, earthquake or a tornado somewhere or, or a, a hurricane somewhere, you know, we're there. We're stepping up. When Ebola happened, we stepped up. Even when other people were kind of looking around and, and trying to figure out, well, I don't know, what should we do? And, and that is part of leadership. That's true, by the way, for you individually as well. You have to be willing to take some risks and do some hard things uh, in order to be a leader. Leader is not just a name, uh, a title, and, uh, you know, privileges and perks. So, all right. Um, let's see. It's a, uh, I think it's a gentleman's turn, isn't it? All right. This guy looks sharp right here in the corner. I mean, that's a serious looking coat. Huh? Look at that. That's a good looking coat. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll, I'll call on somebody who's just wearing a suit at some point. But. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I'm Franklin Ngochi from Cameroon.
Uh -huh. So um, uh, we are very grateful for the American leadership um, in our fight against um, violent extremism yeah. and the military response. So my question is on um, what kind of engagement, um, what kind of support we can expect from you in um, uh, building resilient communities, especially along the Sahel where we, have a, a, we are grappling with those issues? Well, this is something that uh, is very important. I, look, um, the sources of violence around the world are multiple. And it's, imp it's important for us to recognize that, sadly, the, the human race has found excuses to kill each other uh, for all sorts of reasons. Uh, you know, in, in the continent of Africa, oftentimes it's been along ethnic and tribal lines. It has nothing to do with religion. It has to do with, you know, you speak a slightly different language than me, or you look just a little bit different. In Northern Ireland, it was religious. Uh, in other places, it just has to do with trying to gain power, uh, or a majority group trying to impose its will on a minority group. So there are all kinds of reasons for violence. But one of the phenomena that we are now seeing is a very specific uh, promotion of violent extremism that oftentimes is twisting uh, and distorting, uh, and, and I think ultimately uh, defying uh, the edicts of uh, one of the world's greatest religions, Islam. And it's being exported and turbocharged through social media uh, and groups like Al-Shabaab and ISIL and Boko Haram. And the question is, how do we fight back against those ideologies in a way that allows us still to be true to the values of peace and tolerance and due process and rule of law. So the United States is obviously committed to this fight against terrorism. And we are working with countries and partnering with countries all around the world to go after whether it's Al Qaeda, Boko Haram. But what we've also said is in order to defeat these extremist ideologies, it, it can't just be military, police, and security. It has to be reaching into communities that feel marginalized and making sure that they feel that they're hurt, making sure that the young people in those communities have opportunity. And that's why it's so important to partner with civil society organizations in countries throughout Africa and around the world who can reach young people before you know, ISIL reaches them, before Al-Shabaab reaches them, and inoculate them from the notion that somehow the solution to their, uh, to their alienation or uh, the source of future opportunity for them is to go kill people. And that's why when I was in Kenya, for example, and I did a, a town hall meeting there, I emphasized what I had said to President Kenyatta. Be a partner with the civil society groups. Because too often there's a tendency <laughs> because what the extremist groups want to do is they want to divide. That's what terrorism is all about. The notion is that you scare societies further polarizes them. The government reacts by further discriminating against a particular group. That group then feels it has no political outlet peacefully to deal with their grievances. And that then, that suppression can oftentimes accelerate uh, even more extremism. And that's why reaching out to civil society groups, clergy, and, and listening and asking, okay, what is it that we need to do in order to make sure that young people feel that they can succeed? 
What is it that we need to do to make sure that they feel that they're fully a part of this country and are full citizens and have full rights? How do we do that? Bringing them in to plan and design messages and campaigns that uh, embrace the diversity of these countries. Those are the things that are so important to do. We still have to gain intelligence and engage in uh, effective military and police campaigns to eradicate those who are so brainwashed that all you can do is incapacitate them. But the question is constantly, how do we make sure that the, the recruitment of young people into these terrorist organizations, how do we cut off that flow? And that requires more than just military efforts. Okay? All right. Uh, There's a young lady right here. Yeah, right here in the green, in the green and red. Yeah, you? No, 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 right here. Go ahead. No, 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 right here. Yeah, right here, right here in front. Yes. You. Yes. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. President. My name is Jen. I'm from Kenya. And I'm speaking on behalf of my brothers and sisters with albinism from Africa. As you may know, Mr. President, uh, persons with albinism in Africa are being killed and their body parts harvested for ritual purposes. My request to you is to raise this issue with the heads of states from African countries to bring these atrocities to an end for the benefit of us, four of us in this room, and our, and our brothers and sisters back in Africa. Thank you. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, well, can I just say, uh, you know, the notion that any African would discriminate against somebody because of the color of their skin after what black people around the world have gone through is crazy. It is infuriating. And, and, and I have no patience for it. I, when I was in Africa, I said, you know, the, the, there are important traditions and uh, folk ways that need to be respected. That's part of who you know, each culture is, each country is. But there's also just foolish traditions and, and old ways of doing business that are based in ignorance. And they need to stop. And the, the, the idea that you'd have, that a society would visit violence on people because of pigmentation that, that's, not a, that's not a tradition that is worth preserving. That's, that's tomfoolery. That's, that's, that's craziness. It's, it's cruel. The same is true with practices like genital mutilation. That just has to stop. It's, it's, you, don't, you don't do violence to young girls. Just because your great grandfather, or because there's no there's no there's no reason for it other than to suppress women, that's the rationale of it. That's what it's based on. Bride abduction, bad tradition, end it. Beating women, not a good tradition. I don't care that that used to be how things were done. Soci societies evolve. 
based on new understandings and, 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 and new, new science and new appreciation of how, who we are. And, and so we can preserve great traditions, music, food, dance, language, art, but, but, but if there's a tradition anywhere in Africa or here in the United States or anywhere in the world that involves treating people differently because you're scared of them or because you're ignorant about them or because you want to feel superior to them, it's a bad tradition. And you have to challenge it. And you can't, you, you can't accept excuses for it. You know, uh, Grace was up here. You heard the power of Grace's talking. Now, traditionally, people with disabilities are treated differently because people are ignorant. And when, here in the United States, we passed the, uh, the American Against Disabilities Act, and that opened up more opportunities, and suddenly there are ramps so people can access it, and there are computers and new technologies so that people uh, who maybe couldn't communicate before can communicate. And it turns out there's all this talent and brilliance, and people can do these things. Well, then people's attitudes have to change, and the societies have to change. And that's why young people are so important in changing attitudes. The same, by the way, is true for sexual orientation. The, the, uh, I spoke about this. I spoke about this in Africa, and it's, you know, everybody's like, oh, we don't want to hear that. <laughs> but, but, but I, you know, the truth of the matter is, is that uh, if, if you're treating people differently just because of who they love and who they are, then there's a connection between that mindset and the mindset that led to racism and the mindset that, that leads to <laughs> ethnic conflict. It means that you're not able to see somebody else as a human being. And, and so you can't, on the one hand, complain when somebody else does that to you, and then you're doing it to somebody else. You can't do it. There's, there's got to be a, some consistency to how you think about these issues. And that's going to be up to young people because old people get stuck in their ways. They do. They do. You know, and, and that's true here in the United States. I mean, the truth of the matter is, is that uh, when I started running for president, everybody said, ah, oh, yeah. A black guy named Barack Obama, he's not going to win the presidency of the United States. But what I was banking on was the fact that with all the problems that still exist in the United States around racial attitudes, et cetera, things had changed, and, and young people and, and new generations had, had suddenly understood that, in Dr. King's words, you have to be judged not by the color of your skin, but the, by the contents of your character. And, and that doesn't mean that everything suddenly is perfect. It just means that young people, you can lead the way and set a good example. But it requires some courage because the old thinking, people will push back at you. And if you don't have the convictions and the courage to be able to stand up for what you think is right, then, uh, then cruelty will, will perpetuate itself. So you, you guys are on the spot. Here, if there's one thing I want Yali leaders to come out with is that notion of you are strong by, by taking care of the people who are vulnerable, by, by looking after uh, the, the minority, lo looking after the, the disabled, look, looking after the vulnerable. You're not strong by, by putting people down. You're, you're strong by lifting them up. All right, that's, that's, that's the measure of a leader. All right. Um, how much time we got? I've only got time for one more question. Now, now first of all, first of all, uh, the women, you've got to put your hands down, because I just asked a women question. All right, so it's got to be a guy. 
And I promised I'd ask a guy in a suit. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I'm just going to ask this guy right here. All right. Look at him. He's all buttoning up. He looks very sharp. Thank you, Mr. President. <laughs> My name is Zolu Shala Owonikoko from Nigeria. Thank you. Um, I want to say we appreciate all the great work um, that the United States is doing with Nigeria and many other African countries especially as it concerns infrastructural development policies and all of those. But I'm of the opinion that um, if we do not make investment in education more than any other sector of the economy, then um, we are not building a sustainable partnership. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. And I'm saying that in respect to the fact that um, we are all aware of the intellectual drain that Africa is experiencing due to the fact that um, the grass seems green on this side. And then we attract, the United States attracts so many intellectuals who should have stayed to develop and run these programs. For, is, for example, recently when you were in Kenya, you launched a project um, around power and energy. I'm of the opinion that if that program is going to be success, successful and sustainable, then all of those programs should include the partnership of universities. Because through that, we can build the, the capacity of universities, and then those countries can go around in other African countries replicating that. Right. So in that case, we can control the drain that is moving from Africa to the West or to any other part of the country. Okay. So I want to um, ask that what is the United States doing to control this intellectual drain to right. the Western world? And what are you doing to increase, more than others, the investment in education so that our partnership and development can be truly sustainable? Thank you. Okay, good. That's good. That was an excellent question. I, it is an excellent question, um, but I'm going to reverse the question a little bit. The question is not what is the United States doing to reverse the brain drain. The question is what are your countries doing to reverse the brain drain? Now. Many of you have friends who study overseas. They study in the West. And then they decide to stay instead of going back home. Now, the United States, we are partnering with every country here. I guarantee you there are programs to invest in education in your country. There are programs to work with the universities in your countries. I think you make an excellent point that on big projects like Power Africa, we should make sure that there is a capacity, capacity building component. And in fact, one of the things that's been done with our development uh, assistance that we're providing is to emphasize capacity building. So for example, our, our Feed the Future program, the goal is not to just keep on sending food forever. The goal is teaching farmers to double or triple or quadruple their yields, which then gives them more income, which then allows them to buy maybe a tractor uh, or to start a cooperative food processing plant that then accesses the market and the money gets reinvested. And now you are building jobs and commerce inside the country as opposed to just being an aid recipient. So I'm all about capacity building. But ultimately, why is it that you have so many talented, well-educated young Africans leaving instead of staying? Why is it that you have so many talented, well-educated people from the Middle East or parts of Asia or Latin America who would rather live here than there. The issue is not just that these are wealthy, you know, we're a wealthier country. I think it's fair to say, and you know better than I do, but part of it has to do with 
a young person's assessment of, can I succeed in applying my talents if, for example, the economy is still built on corruption so that I have to pay a bribe or be well connected in order to start my business? Or is there still, are there still ethnic rivalries in the country? Which means that if I'm from the wrong tribe, I'm less likely to advance. Or is there still so much sexism in the country that if I'm a woman, then I'm expected just to be at home and be quiet when I'm a trained doctor? Or is there a lack of rule of law or basic human rights and freedoms that make me feel as if I am restricted in what I can do? I make this point to say that some of the brain drain is economic, but some of it has to do with people's assessments of if I stay in my country, am I going to have the ability to succeed? And that's why when I talk to leaders in Africa or anywhere around the world, I say, look, if you put together the basics of rule of law and due process and democracy, and you're able to keep peace so that there's not conflict and, and constant danger, and the government's not corrupt, then even a poor country, you're going to attract a lot of people who are going to want to live there because they'll feel like they're part of building something and are contributing something. Because the one thing I've discovered is, you know, right now I, I live in a big house, but it's a lease, you know, I, I have to give it up in 18 months. <laughs> you know, a big house is nice for the first, you know, month, it's like, well, this is, this is a really big house. <laughs> then after about two months, you realize, I, I, I can't live in all these rooms. My life is not appreciably, uh, appreciably better once I've got the basics. And I think a lot of young Africans would be much more interested in staying even if they don't have as big of a house or, you know, the shopping malls aren't as big or if they felt as if the basics are taken care of, I can keep my family safe, I can practice my profession, I'm not going to be discriminated against. The government is well-meaning and well-intentioned and is not corrupt. And you know, public investments are being made. Then people, I think, would have a sense of meaning in their lives. That doesn't mean that there aren't going to be some people who would still rather you know, live in London or New York because they think they can make more money. But I think that, as much as anything we do, is going to reverse the brain drain. And that's why... Uh, what you do is going to be so important. Because if you set a good example of going back home and rebuilding your country, and if you as young leaders are creating an environment in which young people can succeed and you're setting a new set of expectations about how exciting it is to be part of something new, that can help turn the tide. So good luck. All right? Thank you, everybody. Viewers, without event, there can never be history. And when history is made, it's certainly for posterity. The Young African Initiative, Leaders Initiative have demonstrated what is in them. They have shown the world that they are ready to go to turn their passion to purpose. Thank you, President Barack Obama, for this worthy initiative. We are grateful for you putting the life and the hope for the hopeless. These are the leaders of tomorrow. They've shown it and they are ready. Of course, with what is going on in America today, bridging the gap and building the bridge and bringing the 55 nations of Africa on the core of reality here in America, the world is going to witness a change. A change in the global economy, a change in
day-to-day -day activity, a change in the emerging marketing opportunity, a change uh, that will now put the unity of the entire world together. This change remains the only constant in life. Growth is a recession. Thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to now bring initiative for reality and to create what will be a lifelong opportunity for everybody in America, in Africa, and in the global community. Thanks for watching.